John Peter Thompson is the chair of the Prince George's County Historic Preservation Commission and has been serving on the commission for many, many years. We have the last, uh, I don't know, 2003. how many years as chair. Mm -hmm. First as vice chair and then as, as chair of the commission. And he, um, that's not the only community service he's performed over the years. He's been a trustee of the Prince George's County Library system and he's actively involved in uh, matters of invasive species uh, as a private consultant and also uh, what was the Invasive Species Council for the government? So I was on the Federal Advisory Committee on Invasive Species, the U.S. National Invasive Species Council for about as long as I've been on the HPC. And uh, he's an internationally recognized expert on invasive species which is obviously the subject of another talk altogether, but I think he'll touch on that a little bit today with Bark. But um, we're very happy uh, to have him give of his time today to give us this um, whirlwind lecture on the history of Prince George's County from 1696 until today uh, in four short hours. No, um, in... <laughs> In, in just about an hour, and then uh, with time for questions, obviously, uh, it can expand. Um, I think that's enough. Anything else? I think that, that yeah, about covers that, it. That covers it. About um, two years ago, I um, taught a class through the community college on the history of Prince George's County. I spent 28 hours and only got to 1820. Um, I figure that I need about 58 60 some hours to do the three centuries plus and to do it right. So we're not going to do that today. The second thing is we're going to do this backwards in time. Rather than starting with um, the Senate of Rome, moving you up to the Magna Carta, kind of getting you used to all of that, I figured you'd be asleep and we'd be out of time. We're going to go backwards in time and see how this works. Uh, and we're going to try to answer the question of how did we get here? What happened in the past that brought us to where we are today as a county? And with that, I guess the first slide is the title slide so we can go yes. to the next Cycles of history. Yes, I want you to just briefly, and I'm going to assume that none of you know what these dates actually signify. So, if I remember correctly, does, is the first oldest date up there 1608? 1696. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Interesting. It's your slide. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Missed a year. 1608, the English came to the Mid-Atlantic at Jamestown, and about 80 years later, there was a cultural, social, political revolution in the English colonies known as the Glorious Revolution. It turns out that there is an 80-year cycle in American history, and interestingly enough, it kind of overlaps with Prince George's County history. So 1696 is the founding of Prince George's County. We'll revisit this if we ever get there. Uh, 1776 should be about 80 years later. Did I do the math right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you added 80 years, you're into just before the Civil War, the end of slavery. If you add 80 years, you're in the Great Depression. And if you add 80 years, where are you? 2016. Present. 2016, present, yep. Yeah. So these are kind of our chapters to think about. Next slide. Who is this and why should we care? That's Prince George. Yes, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> and we care because? I dressed up as him as Halloween. <laughs> yes, uh, because um, Denmark and Norway. Yeah, this is who our county is named after, a prince of Denmark, right out of Shakespeare. Not an English prince, a Danish prince. Now, he married a woman who was the last Stuart queen of Scotland and the last English Queen of England and the first Queen of Great Britain, Queen Anne. Um, so we care because we run around telling people we work in, live in, struggle in, have fun in Prince George's apostrophes county. Next. 
we'll revisit him if we get there. County seal. Yes. So this is all over the place. How come? Calvert seal. Well, it's actually Queen Anne's seals. Queen Anne. She's the husband. Um, this is because heraldry, a seal, is the formal statement of power. Today, if you bought a house or a condo or even a car, you get a title, right? Uh, a long time ago, you got a coat of arms. This was what you were entitled to. The government of Prince George's is entitled to do whatever it's doing. And this is an obscure historical remnant of the authority of the county to make decisions. It's the symbolic representation of the government. And just now, because Howard is so thrilled that I do this to him every day, you can see it in Latin at the bottom, it says semper eadem. So when Howard graciously says, how are you doing? I say, always the same. It's the county motto since 1696. <laughs> Next slide. Flags <laughs> yeah. tell us a story. Yes, this is just a little very quick thing. You know you have a Prince George's County flag. The flag is actually, uh, if you take the seal out, it's the flag of England. It's also the cross of St. George, so you can see the wordplay. Mm -hmm. Prince George of Denmark, St. George of England. I put some other flags on here. We don't have time to go into it. In the bottom left is a curious, it uh, looks like the Maryland flag with a Union Jack in it. That was the colonial flag of Maryland. We'll get to that maybe. Next slide. Did the county map always look like this? Yes, now um, my friend and colleague and liaison may have put a new map in. Uh, if he didn't, can you t describe the map to me? The map on the left is yellow and has modern place names in it. Mm -hmm. The map on the right is ancient. Prince George's County originally didn't exist, obviously. Um, and we'll get to that. There was no Prince George's Culvert County, or Culvert County, Calvert County to some, was both sides of the Patuxent, and Charles County was both sides of the Potomac all the way up from St. Mary's or from present Culvert and Charles County. In 1696, um, for reasons that we'll discover in a minute, they created a new county, this county of Prince George's, that included all of, Was all of present Prince George's, Washington, D.C., Montgomery County, Frederick County, let's see if I can do this, Washington, Allegheny, Garrett County, and parts of Carroll and Howard County. That's the original Prince George's County in 1696. Next slide. Is this the strange little map? Well, it's the chart. chart. Yes. All right. So I, because of my audience, I'm going to assume that you're kind of familiar with what to some in the public is the maze of government and courts. And it's sometimes tough to figure out who you should be talking to about what. And it seems like this has been here forever. But it hasn't, and uh, this is a remnant of the English parliamentary system. If we have time, we're going to get back here, but your government didn't just sort of happen like this. Can anybody tell me on here, you, you have the parks and planning, I think, uh, hopefully is on the left, and in the center is kind of county executive and council, and on the right is the court system, is that correct? Yes. Basically. Which of these is the oldest? The court system. Yes, that's correct. We'll revisit that. The court system is by far the oldest of the government in Prince George's. Next slide. Prince George's County has uh, many municipalities. If you scan through the dates here, you'll see a few of them are 18th century, a couple early 19th century, and then all of a sudden after the Civil War, 1870 to 1950, we have an explosion of municipalities. If we get that far, we're going to explain why that is. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Suburbanization? Yeah, it's even more, that, that's, yes, that's the uh, heading. And then the subheader is <laughs> developers. <laughs> Oh, is right. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Today is tomorrow's history. How did we get here? 
uh, what, what, what am I, what's my yeah, pictures of the university? Yes, houses. somebody want to describe Prince George's County today? I mean, we can, I can point randomly, you know, just, just describe the county out loud. Urban and suburban. Urban, mixed suburban. And rural, mixed together. Urban, suburban, rural. Demographically. Majority, minority. Majority, minority. Oh. Anything else? What's our industry? Mm. Public sector. Government. Yeah, government. Government, <laughs> probably. Uh, yeah, you could. Real. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. All right. So we have a, a wide range, right? It's, it's, this is this broad uh, umbrella of possible descriptions. Uh, National Harbor to Llamas along the Patuxent. Um, we're going to visit some of the government sites in a little bit. The question is, how did we get here? Because this wasn't always Prince George's. This wasn't even Prince George's when I was growing up. This is very Prince George's right now. Next. Next. Who are these people? <laughs> Why are they in, in uh, Prince George's County history talk? Yes. And what are their jobs? Yeah, when I first gave this talk, the uh, hopefully it's the county executive on the left. It's the governor and the county executive. Oh, he's reversed the order. Okay. Um, I gave the talk two years ago, and it was Rashern, and so this, this slide made more sense because both of them were Prince Georgians. Um, and the governor is from Prince George's County. Um, our county executive today is the first black woman county executive in county history. How long have we had county executives, you asked? Well, you're going to find out in a few seconds. Hmm. 1994, who are these men? Why are they in a Prince George's County history club? What were their jobs? Right, two more Prince Georgians, another governor. Prince George has produced I, over a dozen governors for the state of Maryland. Uh, I think it's 14, but I forgot to look it up. Um, and that's Glenn Denning and Wayne Curry. What happened in 1992 by demographic planners? It was the end of a social phenomenon called white flight. flight. Ta! <laughs> See how easy this is? <laughs> this is the year it became a majority minority county, or close enough, 1992. This is the beginning of current modern Prince George's County, 1992. It is the end of white flight. Why was there white flight? Well, I don't know we have time to discuss that, and I don't know that the answer um, makes everybody happy. Racism. And that's where we're going. White flight um, is based on something that happened. I told my 14-year-olds, you know, today, this is the county today, let's go back to when your mother and father were in uh, ninth grade, which would have been about 1992 conveniently. Let's go back to when your grandparents were um, in school. Next slide. 1972 bonds. Yeah, so here we are. The grandparents are now in ninth grade, more or less. And we have the busing decision, which, um, how do I want to say this? It didn't initiate white flight. It, it added um, uh, jet fuel to white flight. This was the final straw for old Prince George's County. And with this decision, everybody know about this decision? I know you do, Lawrence. You can elaborate on it if you'd like. So this is, yeah, I didn't hear, yeah, we know this. That's scary, because my 14-year-olds had no idea either. This is the famous busing decision, because the federal government had to come down and exercise the authority under the 14th Amendment, uh, because Maryland was a little lax. By the way, I just learned something. When did Maryland finally ratify the 15th Amendment, giving black men the vote? Don't say anything, Gail, you know now. 1973. When was it ratified by the rest of the country? 1870. Okay. Um, busing said we can't have separate but equal, which meant separate but unequal schools that Plessy Ferguson was out, 
and that Prince George's needed to get on the ball because of earlier Supreme Court ruling in the 1950s, the famous Brown uh, versus Board of Education case, and Prince George's County, you have to stop screwing around, and we're going to step in, and the courts are going to work out this problem that you can't seem to work out. We are going to integrate the public schools. Now, most places started willingly or unwillingly right after the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It took Prince George's a little while and a really strong kick in the rear from the federal government to get on the ball. And this case was just finally released from the courts within the last few years. Mm -hmm. Like 2010, 2012, uh, the court system has been watching this county for decades to make sure we behaved. Mm -hmm. The federal government. Mm -hmm. Next slide. 1970, what is home rule? Okay, this is the answer to how old your government is. The government of, current government of Prince George's County was uh, 1970. You do not have a historic form of government. You have a home rule, a chartered form of government. The citizens of the county petitioned the General Assembly. The General Assembly passed a law enabling the voters of the county to write up, we call it the, uh, the, the subtitles, that make up the county charter, and to establish a government with a legislative branch and a county executive. For most of our 300 years, this is not how the county was run. This is something novel and new, home rule, um, 1970. This is also within a few years when the first black politicians were actually elected to the General Assembly and to other elected offices in Prince George's County. So civil rights takes 100 years for the Civil War to get finished in Prince George's County. Mm -hmm. Next. 1964, the end of legal recognition. Yes, so I'm actually old enough to remember these signs. Me too. Um, surprise, surprise, my 14-year-olds thought I somehow manipulated the PowerPoint to create the sign, which was so scary. Um, this, this is before 1964. I lived in Beltsville. We lived on the west side of the railroad track, and I was in, and then there was US-1, so there's four lanes of highway, two, la two rail tracks, and I was told that I had to stay on my side of US-1 because those people lived in Vansville. Nobody kind of told me who those people were, and I don't know how at five I was going to cross Route 1, Baltimore Boulevard, plus the B&O Railroad, to get over to explore who those people might be, but it was very clear that I wasn't going to be allowed to do that. Um, this was the racism of this county that I was brought up in. Next. Oh, 1964, what happens nationally? I've already alluded to it. 64. Civil Rights Act. Civil Rights Act, yes. I, I do have to mention that Maryland didn't like Prince George's say, oh, hey, wait, maybe we need civil rights. When was the first civil rights law passed? Obviously not 1964. This is a trick question. 1866. Huh. What was that? Dred Scott? No, 1866. The um, 13th and abolishing slavery and the 14th Amendment are, are right. one is in and one is on its way. And the 14th Amendment gives Congress the power to enforce okay. the amendment, and there were certain groups in the United States that weren't interested in this project. So Congress passed laws based on the amendment that allowed it to militarily go in and enforce civil rights. Next. Ah, yes. So the county, when I was growing up, was rural was suburban, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but it was suburban, what we call inside or established communities. Outside this super road, the Beltway, which by the way, 
The last section to be completed was where? Prince George's County. Prince George's County, yes, big surprise. Think <laughs> Metro. Um, we're, we're first in the uh, newspaper and last in the hearts of infrastructure development. Um, but I'm not bitter. <laughs> the Beltway becomes our new main street and provides this transportation arterial, um, this roadway to connect the expansion of subdivisions that have become the county we know today. Without the Beltway coming in, well, we wouldn't have, we maybe we would have been building roads out from Washington, D.C., but it's the coming of the Beltway, our main street, that creates the dynamics for the present Prince George's County and really creates a barrier between rural Prince George's and developed Prince George's. 1959 got its base plans. The federal government, as we're going to see, um, because of World War II, was a growing enterprise, and it needed room. The last time I counted, I think there were 34, it's on my blog, 34 federal agencies and some 60 associated sub-departments of the federal government, one way or the other, here in Prince George's County. And Goddard is part of what I call the, the golden high-tech triangle of Prince George's County. You know, Prince George's was high-tech before high-tech was cool. Where did the United States learn to fly? College Park Airport. Right. We'll, we'll get there. Goddard is the other side of that. Prince George's has been in the forefront of science and technology, and we're going to go back a, a longer than 1908, 1910. Uh, we've always had a hand in science, and some of this is because of our earlier history. So Goddard is um, a representation of the influence of the federal government and high-tech jobs that come from our industry, the federal government. Next. 1950, Fairmont Heights High School. Well, we talked about um, integrating the schools. In 1952, they opened a, the first modern black, was a junior high high school for blacks. This was a segregated school. We're now in the time of segregation, the black code, or some people call it Jim Crow. And Fairmont Heights was the first public, modern, black, junior, senior high school. 1952, it took that long to um, recognize a need. Well, by the way, tomorrow I understand, just a plug, <laughs> there's a, a meeting about the future of this site and this school. 1940, Benjamin and Clara Mitchell. Okay, so I can't resist sticking in a few. I, uh, I keep saying 426. The Historic Preservation Commission has its, uh, keeps an eye on approximately 426, give or take a few, um, historic sites. And one of them is the Van Horn Mitchell House. I think it's painted purple today. This is um, a speaker of the house around the uh, War of 1812. He was a plantation owner, a, a, a slaver, who owned farmland from what we call D.C. today down to Upper Marlboro. Not contiguous, but independent farms. He will lose this property because he's on, surprise, the wrong side of the Civil War. Um, the house becomes a um, kind of a rental property, if you will. It's kind of ignored. Nobody cares. Multitude of owners. The late 1930s, 1940, uh, Clara and Benjamin Mitchell bought the house and put it together. And you say, why do we care? Because my research showed that in the 1943, I think it was, when Elijah Muhammad got out of jail and there were assassination attempts. This is the house he hid out in. This is the house 
where Malcolm X came in the 19, late 50s, early 60s. Anwar Sadat, Cassius Clay. This is a house that we ought to be researching, but we're too busy. Too busy to care. 1941 Riverside Field. What's the claim to fame here? This is the oldest privately owned black airport in the United States. It's also, if I remember correctly, and I wish I could read now, um, that some of the Tuskegee Airmen teachers learned to fly here. This is now part of the Parks Department's park system and a historic site. Um, we do want to remember that black entrepreneurs were busy working around the black code, and they were doing high tech also. <clears throat> Greenbelt is the federal government started by the Republicans during Hard Harding and Coolidge, really developed by the Hoover administration and taken over by Franklin Roosevelt. This is one of three, I believe there were three planned communities in the United States. Up until now, the towns, villages, communities developed in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, there was zoning as early as the 1890s. In fact, if we get to Bladensburg, Bladensburg tried some zoning laws like you can't make gunpowder in the middle of Bladensburg. That's as early as 1815 <laughs> when the place kept blowing up. They uh -huh. said public safety says maybe this isn't a good idea. Um, tell me what side I want. <laughs> Greenbelt. Yes, Greenbelt. So first planned city. This was part of the United States Department of Agriculture, um, and today a going concern, as you would call it, one of our uh, great municipalities in Prince George's County. Next. 1927 Richland School. Before there was a county-built black school, um, there was the I guess he was the chairman or president uh, of Sears Roebuck. And he came up with this idea, a, a matching grants, if you will, idea, to, to allow black communities to build real school buildings for the children who couldn't go to the white schools. And we have, uh, in my opinion, because I haven't seen too much lately, uh, one of the best uh, restored examples of a Ridgely school, which were mostly built in the Confederacy, um, and the, because of the Parks Service and our your very own Susan Pearl, uh, this is a major achievement, remembering a time when black communities had to educate themselves, no support from the local government whatsoever. One of the first uh, black municipalities in the state of Maryland. I used to think it was the first, but I've been disavowed of that notion. I think there's an older one not in this county. Um, North Brentwood was, uh, there was a, a union, a white union officer in the Civil War. He bought uh, some land for development along the rail line, which we will meet in a little bit. Um, on the high ground, he put the, a little white development, and he had commanded black troops in the Civil War, so he made it available for black troops to buy the low, the low ground, which explains the flooding. Uh, but, but at least he did it. He didn't redline them from owning anything, and the little town community will get its ordinance and its municipality charter uh, in the early 20th century. MNCPPC. Yeah, look at that. You're older than the county government. <laughs> so um, it became obvious to the General Assembly that actually ran Maryland counties. We had something called a commissioner system. Uh, originally, the court, the administrative judge of the county court, would appoint a commissioner to collect taxes or build roads or jail people, whatever needed to be done. Um, after the Civil War, we developed a commissioner system. They were executives with 
certain power to pass certain, you'd call it, codes or regulations under direction from the General Assembly. But major laws, the commissioners would have to go to the General Assembly in Annapolis to ask for what you'd call subtitles to be written, enforcement laws to be written. So we had a commissioner system. Um, where would this be writing again? MNCPs. Yes, yes. So this system, um, General Assembly, there were no cell phones, there was no Instagram, it was a little hard to keep track what the commissioners were up to. Land development had kind of spiraled out of control. This is the part about, I told you, we get a multitude of municipalities. What, what's happening is land rich, cash poor landowners were discovering the growth in Washington and the desire to live outside of the city, so they were developing the land. And you can see in the newspapers ads uh, promising paved roads, lighting, rail stop. And then when the last lot was filled, uh, sold, no roads, sidewalks, schools, or anything built, they would declare bankruptcy. That left the communities um, in a pickle because the county commissioner system wasn't about that didn't make these promises. That was a community thing, not a county thing. So the communities, in order to get their paved road lights, you know, the amenities that had been promised but suddenly disappeared after all the promises were made. Does any of this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the, the towns would go, such as Fairmont Heights, would go and get a charter so that they could take upon themselves to finish off what had been promised to them the best they could. That's why you get these, what we call established communities, uh, popping up all of these little municipalities because they had to uh, fill in the gap. Well, the General Assembly by the 1920s could see what was going on and it said, hold the phone. Something's wrong there in Upper Marlboro. So we're going to create a state planning agency that's you guys. <laughs> um, and you're going to make the development plans. And you're going to make sure that there's a road, that there's a school, that there's a fire hydrant if necessary. You get the picture. You're going to have parks. You're going to make sure that there's open space. This is park and planning's mission in order to control the commissioner system of government. Now we well, no, no comments. Room may be bugged. Um, <laughs> next slide. 1918 Chevrolet. Where am I in time? Chevrolet, 1918. Uh, three, 317. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> yes, uh, Chevrolet is another example of um, development. This from the Magruder family, um, which there was no money left in tobacco, sharecropping, uh, out, you know, renting the property out at minimal return wasn't working. And so Chevrolet is developed at the same time. Um, this is a, a form of the property owner themselves working with a developer <coughs> did it. So it wasn't so abandoned as some of the municipalities. They actually managed to put in most of what they promised. Next. Yes, I want to have a dual picture here because not only does the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, the largest agricultural research center in the world, um, it's where all your food labels come from. Yes, you know that. The tomato that you really don't want to buy that you can throw against a wall. That was developed here, the Roma tomato. Uh, we don't have time to go into bark uh, completely. Uh, most of the street trees, the Glendale Azalea, that's all bark. But this should also be the College Park Airport. Uh, this is really the beginning of 20th century development technology and government influence coming into the county. Um, bark is uh, kind of a hidden gem, and uh, hopefully we can keep it from being turned into townhouses. <laughs> Next slide. 19, 1894, October 20th, lynching of Stephen So how we... 
we have racism institutionalized. I guess I've made that pretty clear um, in the preceding century. But how did we do that? We being people that, you know, old white guys that look like me. We used violence. Um, now, Prince George's County isn't necessarily in the forefront of this, but it's not a laggard either. And I, this is a random sample. When I had my 14-year-olds, the conversation, at last they had heard of something I was talking about. They did know what lynching was, sort of. Um, but they didn't quite understand, and I remember in two of the classes, both of them young ladies who said, well, if they knew who the white boys were, why didn't they arrest them? And my answer was, because their fathers looked like me. Why would we do that? Oh, they said. Um, this goes on in Prince George's, um, I, used, I think the last lynching was in the 30s, 1933, 1934, about one every five years. There are two that I know of lynchings that are not black men. Um, but those are then outliers. Uh, it's not to say that lynching was an equal opportunity. Opportunity, It was white power and privilege using violence to secure power that otherwise they would have been losing to the enfranchisement of the black vote. 1867, Odin Bowie. Yes, uh, so Odin Bowie that you know that you're on Odin Bowie Drive, right? Yeah. This is the second Governor Bowie, a Mexican of war uh, hero. You know there's a, how many of you have to go out to 301 and get caught by the train when you're trying to go home? That's his rail line, he built that. That's the Baltimore and Potomac rail line. Um, he eventually works out a deal with the Pennsylvania Railroad that will put the B&O out of business, and it is that rail line that does it, our little Upper Marlboro rail line. There used to be, as you're going out of Upper Marlboro, um, one of his rail stations just uh, down the road. Now, Governor Bowie, war hero, slave owner, horse racing enthusiast, is the probably the largest slave owner in Prince George's County before the Civil War. So you would expect, what color was his uniform in the Civil War? Blue. Blue. Yeah, it was blue. Actually, he doesn't put one on. He swears allegiance to the United States, and he serves as a Maryland senator uh, with allegiance to what they called the Unionist Party, the United States. Unlike many of his cousins and neighbors, he did not go south. He stayed in the Maryland Senate. He becomes chairman of the Democratic Party. Last time I checked, there were like 72, maybe it's 74 elected officials in Prince George's and they're all Democrats. It's because this is the man who put the Democratic Party machine together as uh, during the Civil War. He was chairman of the Democratic Party of Maryland. Um, I told you he was a racehorsing enthusiast. You know the first racehorse was introduced to North America here in Prince George's. Yes? Knew that? There's an obscure fact. And that house still stands too. We may get to it. Um, as a horse racing enthusiast in 1864, he goes to the Democratic Party um, convention to nominate a man to run against Abraham Lincoln, a man named George McClellan. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, Odin Bowie didn't like George McClellan. We don't have time to talk about why. The chairman of the Democratic Party was a man uh, who liked horse racing, whose name was August Belmont. Horse racing. <laughs> Belmont. 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 Belmont Stakes. Good. So. This up-and-coming young politician meets Belmont after the Civil War. He goes up to a dinner party. Um, he makes a suggestion that all these rich horse racing guys, um, they should have a horse race and the loser will buy dinner the next year for everybody. They all agree and then Odin Bowie says, will you hold it in Maryland if I build the racetrack here? And they say yes. He's about to become governor. 
He doesn't use governor money, doesn't use his own, he, you know, investor money, buys an old farm outside of this downtown Baltimore called Pimlico. And he has the first dinner stakes race. And the next year he has a race and he puts his finest horse up against a horse from Massachusetts and he loses. And what was the name of the horse that won? Gallant Fox. Preakness. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Preakness? Yeah. Okay. Belmont Stakes. Kentucky Derby is the newcomer. It's the younger one. Preakness is the second oldest of the Triple Crown. The Belmont Stakes is the oldest. Um, Odin Bowie puts his rail line, as, as I said, and he will, after the war, become president of the Baltimore Light Rail Company until he dies in 1892. Um, next slide. A new constitution in 1864. Yes. Maryland will abolish slavery in 1864. Um, ask if they had a choice. Not really. It's kind of an occupied state, and plus, if you didn't take an oath of loyalty, yeah, you weren't um, permitted actually to vote, which severely limited the people who thought that the abolition of slavery was a bad idea. Uh, they weren't asked. Um, one of the leaders of this movement to abolish slavery, and he's a reluctant leader, uh, is our next slide, I hope. Sure. <coughs> on bell, so. Oh, it isn't. Sorry. <laughs> Hold that thought. Um, did you know there was a Civil War battle in Beltsville? No, of course you didn't. <laughs> the Battle of Beltsville, July 12th, I'm not making this up. The Confederates swung around, they invaded uh, Frederick County, they marched on Washington, there's a fort off Georgia Avenue called Fort Stevens. Jubal Early, what a great name, uh, was the Confederate commander. This is the battle where Abraham Lincoln got up on the the fortifications with his top hat and the Confederates are busy shooting at him and a young major says, get down, damn fool, get down. And that young major becomes, so the story got, well, he does become Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, whether he actually <laughs> said that or not, we're not really sure, it's a good story. Well, meanwhile, the Confederates, led by two Marylanders, uh, raced across, burned some bridge, terrified Baltimore, came down across the Patuxent through, um, they wanted to take Laurel, but there were men with no legs and things in foxholes, so they went around. They came out at Beltsville St. John's Hill, um, and they drove off the Yankee cavalry, and then they went to lunch in College Park, dining with a professor from the university who was a cousin of the general commanding, and that's the Battle of Beltsville Casualty 2. Um, it was a near miss because their next thing would have been Fort Lincoln, but Seward, the Secretary of War, had armed uh, bureaucrats, that would be you guys, <laughs> with pitchforks, pipes, and sticks, and marched 700 of them up to Fort Lincoln to defend it at all costs because he realized there were no soldiers around to do that, so the federal government office workers must have been a really interesting song. <laughs> um, next slide. 1839, Mount Hope. Gee, did, what happened to John Bain? All right, well, we're, we're suspended. 1864, I haven't forgotten that. Uh, we're now in the antebellum, or the period of slavery in Prince George's County. Prince George's County is a tobacco-based economy. If we don't run out of time, we're going to find out why um, it was so. Um, Prince George's County was an easy, oh no, that's the wrong word. Maryland was located such that with considerable difficulty, but certainly less than trying to get out of Georgia, you could get, you could be free in a day or two. And with the coming of the B&O Railroad, you could actually be free within 24 hours. Now, we like to say there was an underground railroad, but with the B&O, it was overground. All you had to do was get on one of those freight cars, get to Camden Yard, hustle yourself up to the, uh, it's a, a spur of the Pennsylvania Railroad, you hop on a car there, and you zip into Pennsylvania, and that's freedom. That works on the West Coast. Tubman had a harder line. She had to get through Delaware and the Eastern Shore, and that was a major, major problem. And it's, I'm not making light of trying to run away because um, 
the newspapers are full of runaway ads and ads for return. But the interesting thing is, it's also full of court cases because there were enough people, lawyer types, who had found holes in slavery laws because of the proximity of the district in which they could claim freedom. And this is just one of many cases where um, African American or black woman, in this case, is struggling and using the court system to get her freedom. Now, as a percentage, I'd like to tell you, you know, 50% of them that work for, well, no, that's not true. Um, but there was a constant squeeze on slavery in Prince George's because it was, and again, I hesitate to say too easy, far easier, but no less risky to get out of Prince George's. If you could get into DC, if you could get onto the B&O, those are big ifs, by the way. How did, um, I guess it's time to talk about slavery in Prince George's. Most audiences that I talk to think that uh, slave owners own hundreds of slaves. Well, there's a difference in American slavery between tobacco slavery and deep south slavery. And it's a significant difference. Both are horrible. In the deep south, it's rice or cotton. So the, the white plantation master or mistress does not live with the enslaved people. They're usually miles upriver or back country, <coughs> and they're working the fields, and the quote unquote owner never sees them, lives in Charleston, lives in Savannah. And the crops are two season crops. You have to work really hard for to get the crop in. You have to kind of work a little bit in the summer. Uh, what am I saying? A little bit. It's backbreaking, but it's not too technical to take care of cotton. It's just hard work. And then you got to bring the cotton in. Same thing with rice. You got to plant it. You don't even have to weed it. It's a water crop, and then you have to bring it in. So there's a lot of un unsupervised free time, or from the ownership capital project sensibility, not very productive, and they never quite figured out what to do. Tobacco takes 11 months of highly skilled backbreaking work. There is no off season except between Christmas and maybe the first week of January. That's the off season for tobacco. Tobacco, um, slavery, Tobacco doesn't need hundreds of workers. And so most slave owners in Southern Maryland and <laughs> Prince George's being the leading county had one slave. Kind of needed one for every five acres, would be better one per acre, but that's hard to do. One for five, one for 10 acres. Most people, if they could do five acres of tobacco, that was a big deal. So most slave owners in Prince George's only owned one slave. This is a kind of problem for family units. So slavery in Prince George's County was not full of communities, large communities of enslaved people that could be together at least in the evening for long periods of time. There was a, there was a uh, transient nature of being able to visit a family member in the next farm. But the farms weren't 100 miles apart. They were a few miles apart. And so there's a ebb and flow going on in the county. Also, up until 1820, slavery, if the economy dropped, the slave owner would free everybody. Maryland had, because he didn't want to feed them. Much better than if, he, you know, just, hey, you're free now, and now you have no way of getting any food because you can't even do a little gardening on the side. The state of Maryland puts an end to that and says you can't free slaves under the, if for men, it was under the age of 26. And it wasn't because, they were doing it because they didn't want, oh, you, you could free somebody under the age of 26. Over the age of 26, you had to pay for their retirement by, they stayed enslaved to you. You couldn't free them. 
because they couldn't work in the field either. It was back-breaking work, horrible work. So we have a, um, a not really gone with the wind kind of slavery. The white slave owner is living and is in the minority, surrounded by uh, a large number of enslaved people living within sight. Um, some of the works that the uh, park and planning have done will show the, the, the slave, uh, the big house, the, the white house as surrounded by small enslavement um, residences, encampments, living in the barn, living in the greenhouse. Um, this is not the slavery of the South. And there, when somebody ran away, where did you run away to? Well, Philadelphia was a goal, but usually you ran to a family member, and the, the slave trackers knew this. And you can track genealogically people by watching as the owner says, so-and-so ran away, and we, I think he went to Culver County because he's got a wife down there. And we'll list the, the plantation name. Uh, next slide. 1834, Salutria. Oh, here, here, here we are. So uh, this is now a shopping center. <laughs> it's modern Prince George's. Uh, John Bain. Um, was one of, well, he was the first college-trained medical doctor in Prince George's County. He's one of the three Americans who discovered you like strawberries. You can thank him. He hybridized, uh, one of three men that independently figured out how to hybridize the modern strawberry. Um, he, he was a moderately large slave owner. He had 15 to, Jennifer, did we ever decide 25 maybe? She's not here. Oh, did she? Yeah, I came back. Uh, yeah, I think 25 was the most. Yeah. Um, so he, he's considered a large slave owner. What color was his uniform? And he did put a uniform on in the Civil War. Blue. 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 Yeah, you, you've been tricked enough, huh? <laughs> yes, he, he was a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. State senator, medical doctor, one of the uh, stockholders of the original, and we slipped right past it, the Maryland College of Agriculture, uh, the first research college, which becomes the University of Maryland. He's one of the insiders working with Charles Benedict Colvert on this idea that farming is more than an accident. You, it's a profession, and there should be college-trained farmers uh, because it's an industry. Um, and as a Maryland state senator, he is I have to speculate here because some of the records are missing. He was agnostic at best and maybe against uh, abolishing slavery. And then somewhere in the summer of 1864, it's his vote and his public declaration, the gig is up. Um, I'm going to vote for the abolition of slavery. And what I believe he did, uh, because he becomes the first superintendent of public school system, is he put into the 1864 Constitution the idea of a public school system. And not as superintendent of the public school system in the late 1860s, you can see him writing to the commissioners, you're supposed to send the school $10 for windows. Where's the money? You haven't paid the teachers. Where's the money? And he did it for both the black schools and the white schools. We have his records from his visit to Merkur the black school at Merker, and excoriating the county commissioners for not sending the money that the new public education system demanded that they send to the black schools. Um, so that's uh, John Bain. That gets the University of Maryland in. It gets the abolition of slavery and the creation of a public school system. There is no public school system until 1864. Did I mention that Odin Bowie, the 1864 Constitution was needed, had some problems, legal problems in it. And so Odin Bowie as governor oversees writing, sort of rewriting it to make it more legal. And that is the present Constitution of Maryland, the 1867 Constitution. I believe it's correct when I say we have the oldest active Constitution in the United States. We also have the longest. It's over 50-some thousand words now. 
because we <laughs> amend it day and night. It's a full-time job <laughs> amending it, and it's one of the few documents I, I have not ever been able to read all the way through. It's a, I have no idea what our Constitution actually says, and I'm uh, not sure anybody knows. <laughs> uh, next. Yeah, so this is an example of um, enslaved people were, uh, contrary to some uh, modern people, were not content and happy down on the farm. Uh, the newspapers are full of people who, one way or the other, were not putting up with this and were getting out of town. War of 1812, Battle of Bladesburg. Okay, so you know about the War of 1812 and the Battle of Bladesburg? Yes, everybody, I don't have to go into that. You know, they marched uh, <coughs> right through here, had dinner across the street. Um, let's see, next slide. April, July. Gosh, did Green I take a slide? Can you go one slide more and then come back? Star yeah, the, the slides are out of order. Okay. Also across the street is a cemetery that some folks forgot about. Um, Dr. Beans, poor Dr. Beans, medical doctor, <coughs> educator, tried to build a library in Upper Marlboro School. Um, among other things, he arrested drunken British soldiers on their way back from urban renewal in Washington, D.C. Um, and this offended his uh, you know, earlier dinner guests, the British, who promptly arrested him, and I keep forgetting, I think it's his wife's sister's husband, uh, is a lawyer named Francis Scott Key, who they goes to the boat, and they wander down the Patuxent, the British say, yeah, yeah, we've, we're tired of being mad, we're gonna let you go, but we got some more urban renewal to do in Baltimore. <laughs> Uh, so they sail up to Baltimore, and in the dawn's <coughs> early light, and the, they could, the rockets red glare, et cetera, et cetera. And that's right across the street to the cemetery or the gravesite of Dr. Beans. Uh, yes. Okay, I don't, I don't know what's on the slide anymore. Hopefully, we can get this Hepburn Circuit Court to accept hearsay evidence providing the emancipation of the slave. Yes. So, Gabriel Duvall. Gabriel Duval is an interesting guy. He's a young man. He is one of the reasons there is the United States. So the way this works is there's a, there's a little war which we're going to talk about. And then the states are independent countries. Maryland's an independent country. And they try to kind of work together, much like the EU to get today. <laughs> work just about as well. Um, so the, some of the people in the state said, this isn't working, we need a better system. So they got together, but a lot of Marylanders did not want to, did, did not like this new Constitution Convention idea. And one of the leaders of the anti-federalists, as they began to be, was a man, was the Attorney General of Maryland, a man named Luther Martin. And he was one of the leaders of the small state opposition, Connecticut, was the other Sherman up in Connecticut. We don't like anything about this Constitution. We're going to do everything we can to gum things up. On the other side, another Marylander is Gabriel Duval, And he is, George Washington knows that if Maryland does not ratify this new Constitution, then Virginia won't. And if Virginia doesn't, the other southern states won't. And there will be no United States. And Gabriel Duval is George Washington's spokesman. It's before Twitter. He, <laughs> he's out tweeting for George Washington on why Marylanders should vote for the Constitution. That's his contribution, if you will. He will, in his old age, be appointed to the Supreme Court to the Maryland seat. The, you know, gee, I skipped right after Tommy, didn't I? Yeah. He wasn't really a Prince Georgian. Okay, I'm excused. <laughs> um, that's why I didn't mention Dred Scott. That wasn't a, Prince George's isn't guilty of everything. Um, uh, Gabriel Duval is on the Supreme Court, and some people say he's the least productive justice of all time. Uh, and others say, well, he was a, you know, he owned slaves. What a horrible man. But the, one of the few things he did was this famous decision. 
it, he lost to the other slave owners, but he said, it's not right to tell black people you can't learn to write, you can't own anything, and then when they go to court, tell them you have to produce documents and you have to be able to read and write. You can't hold them to the same standards that you hold somebody that you have allowed to be able to do these things. In other words, this woman had brought half a dozen white witnesses testifying to her claims of freedom. But the courts, and eventually the Supreme Court said, no, you have no documents. And Duval said, that's ridiculous. She, she has established her claim on hearsay because hearsay is the only way she has to document because we have made laws that would not allow her to document in any other fashion. For which, the only thing we remember him for is being a slave owner today, which is kind of unfortunate. His house and his law office is part of the Park System's uh, collection of museum houses. And hopefully we can keep things going there. Next. 1802 The Colvert family. Um, we don't have time for the Lord's Baltimore. This is a branch of the Lord's Baltimore, though if we get there, the founding of Maryland are the Baron Baltimores. And one of the barons um, had a son out of wedlock, and the rest was history, including this house. Um, the Culverts owned Maryland from an English law point of view. Of course, the Piscataway, Kanoi uh, Native Americans, the indigenous people, weren't quite sure what that meant since they were already here. Um, but under English law, the Culverts owned the land. And this is uh, as close as we get to royalty. Um, one of the Culverts marries a Belgian baron. Uh, he builds this wonderful house. Their son is a congressman, sort of the steady hoyer of his day, if you will, a big shot in Congress, founder of the University of Maryland, which we've already discussed, um, creator of the first uh, Chamber of Commerce. In those days, they called it the Agricultural Society of Prince George's County. He also founded the Maryland Agricultural Society. Now, you hear agriculture and think farmers, but you should be thinking Chamber of Commerce. That's what agricultural societies were, businessmen coming together to uh, network and enhance business opportunities. Um, so another one of the prized possessions in the uh, park service, uh, the parks department's uh, possessions. Next. 1776, Captain. Okay, so there was a revolution. This is where I would normally uh, have a couple hours on natural rights. We don't have time for that. Is this uh, Bowie? Yes. Captain Bowie. Yeah. Yes. Uh, at the Battle of Long Island, George Washington got sort of tactically, tactically confused and trapped. Um, there was a, a force of Germans and English coming straight up at him. There was a river behind him with no way off. And Lord Cornwallis, yes, that one, was coming around behind him. So with nothing else to do, he sent the Maryland line, the Maryland regiment, straight into the British Army. Most of the men were either from Prince George's or from Charles County. Um, it didn't end well for the Marylanders, but it is why Maryland is the old line state. Later on, uh, George Washington would see, towards the end of the war, the, Maryland, the Marylanders became the special forces of the Continental Army, and uh, they were his old line, because they bought him enough time to, to rescue the army and get off Long Island. Um, one of the Bowie's died there. Um, this would have been Odin Bowie's great great grandfather's cousin. Doesn't matter. Next, <laughs> the, the Bowie's are all over the place. Uh, what? Bel Air mentions. Ah, well, I told you we'd get to horse racing. This is horse racing. Uh, this isn't part of the Parks Department, right? The city no, of Bowie. Yeah. Is. Yes. This is another Prince George's governor, Governor Ogle. And he brought the first thoroughbreds to North America. And the house is, you know, you can visit it. You ought to visit it. You ought to know about it. Uh, Governor Ogle's house. Uh, what do we got? Jack Ransom's Rebellion, 1739. Okay. So we're back to, you know, we're now century, more than a century of slavery in Prince George's County. 
This is the uh, largest slave insurrection that didn't happen in the western shores of Maryland. And it happened here in Prince George's County. Uh, Jack Ransom um, planned and plotted and, and got together um, a plan to take over the western shore of Maryland and he was turned in by, uh, so the story, so we are told by court documents, um, an enslaved woman to a plantation owner wife who turned in Jack. Um, the General Assembly up until now, uh, well, in, because of this insurrection that didn't quite get off the ground, and by the way, part of this was inspired by uh, not only an unwillingness of African slaves to be slaves, but there was a, um, a, a fundamentalist movement in Christianity, and oh, what was his name? There was the Reverend Whitehead, is that his name? There was a minister uh, who came down through the colonies talking about freedom. Christianity meant freedom for all. Uh, and we know that Jack and some of the conspirators had been at this, so there's kind of a mix of uh, early Christianity and uh, just a resentment of being an enslaved person. Well, the insurrection doesn't go anywhere. Their ringleaders are arrested. Interestingly enough, the governor pardons everybody but Jack Ransom, uh, who is hanged. Um, what was the penalty for, um, it's called treason, <laughs> for an enslaved person or servant for treason? It's to, not only to be hanged, but to be hanged in chains. Suppose you were a wo woman. Just to be burned alive. <laughs> and it didn't happen in Prince George's, but about this time it happened on the, west, uh, the eastern shore woman poisoned the um, master and mistress. Oh, I didn't tell you about Bain and the poisoning. There's so much I haven't told you. Um, and the, the, um, they tried to burn her alive, but nobody knew how to do this, and it was a disaster. So the General Assembly quickly said, okay, we can hang women too. Um, it was considered unseemly up until then. Uh, next. Where, where are we? 1739 St. John, St. Paul. Oh, yes. So th this is what um, Christianity, uh, Protestant Christianity, a big factor. Um, Prince George's County was founded um, at the beginning, well, the heyday of anti-Catholicism. Um, and the established church, there was a law passed by the military governors of Maryland. The Catholic Lord Baltimore's had been thrown out. We don't have time to go into that. And even though it was a Catholic state, uh, the Protestants took control. There was a coup, threw the Catholics out, and then passed laws that Catholics had no rights. Uh, we have Protestantism and the established church. In Upper Marlboro, there was a Presbyterian church. There was a, a Church of England church. Um, the Presbyterians were allowed to have their church, but they had to pay a normal tax plus a tax to the Episcopal Church called a poll tax. And Catholics weren't allowed to worship in public. It was against, against the law until, until the American Revolution. Um, this is the problem of democracy, isn't it? Um, so we have uh, historic churches, uh, Protestant churches here in the county. The churches during the Black Code days and I'm kind of jumping around, but if we go to the period of Jim Crow and, and um, white power and privilege after the Civil War, the black churches of this county served as not only a place of faith and spirituality, but they were the center of government de facto because there were no government services provided by the government. Therefore, the black church was, was the center of black life not only spiritually, but pragmatically and practically. Uh, early in the colonial period, we didn't really have towns as we know them today. We had crossroads, and churches served the same function for the 
European communities. They were the center of the community. 1715, the Lord's Baltimore. Yeah, it's the Lord's Baltimore um, switch religions. <laughs> Uh, so they stop being Catholic, uh, they wait for the anti-Catholic Queen Anne to die, and a German becomes King of England who doesn't speak English, um, and he doesn't really care, and he says, oh, you're a Protestant, so you can have Maryland back, it's too, too problematic to run anyway. Um, I, I don't make this up. <laughs> what happened is, how much time do we have? Uh, five minutes. <laughs> Why is there a general assembly? Because we were across the ocean and we needed some form of government. Well, let's back up. Why? By what right did we cross the ocean? The, the kings. Yes, the king granted a charter. Does everybody know what an IPO is? Yes, the king granted articles of incorporation to a Catholic friend of the family, to the Stuart family, the first Lord Baltimore, and said, go forth and act like a mini king. I'm giving you all the rights of a king. Um, and if you find gold or whatever you find, it's all yours. But you've got to run the infrastructure and everything. You're going to be what's called a Count Palatinate. Don't worry about that. Um, so here he comes across, he's got this document, he's got, he's got a bunch of them. Well, first of all, the Catholics didn't want to come, so he's got a boatload of Protestants. Uh, the second thing they're going to find out, there is no gold. He needs to have some way of enforcing order and providing infrastructure. So he's got some Catholic friends, one guy is going to be in charge of the money chest, one guy is going to make sure documents are correctly signed, but he needs the stockholders. This is people who invested in the company to found Maryland to show up from time to time when they needed to amend what we would call the bylaws, the charter. You know, things change. You need to amend the bylaw. Um, so he calls sometime in, the, I think the first one is 1638, 39. He calls an assembly of the stockholders. Now, there's no Prince George's now. It's all down in St. Mary's. Um, and so they all gather where? Where would you go to gather for a boring public meeting if you didn't have any limitations? The pub. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to a bar. And he sits on one side with his friends, his council, the counselors. They're called the Privy Council sometimes, but that's a longer story. Um, on the other side are the stockholders, and well, okay, this worked. As the stockholders discovered tobacco, and remember what I told you? 11 months, it was really inconvenient to come to St. Mary's County to sit in a bar, no matter how good the drinks were, because you needed to be back taking care of your crop. And, and he was having a hard time. He had to go arrest plantation owners to get them sh to show up once a year to sort of say we need a new law like the 1663 law on, I'm just putting this out here, the first law on pollution in the Chesapeake, 1663. Um, so what he does, he finally gives up and he says, okay, I'm going to draw lines around several of the farms and plantations. We're going to use an old English term called hundreds. Just think districts. And one of you, y'all are going to get together and you're going to delegate your vote, your proxy, to one of you. And you're going to come. And by now, um, the bar wasn't big enough. <laughs> so the delegates met in their bar, and I crossed the street, it's not a big town, in their own original bar, met the counselors to the governor. And now, you can call a house a chamber. What else can you, you can call it a house, right? So you have the house of Delegate. delegates. Delegate. You don't quite have a Senate yet. That doesn't come until the American Revolution, but you get the idea. By the time you get to uh, the Lords Baltimore coming back into power, the problem was every time Lord Baltimore needed infrastructure, like 
needed to dredge. Nobody wanted to pay for it. Does this surprise anybody today? Nope. Let's see. Everybody has demanded infrastructure. Fine. I'm going to hire a dredger. I need a tax to pay for it. Oh, no way, no way. <laughs> Not in my backyard. Not in my backyard. No, no, no. And there's no federal government. He can't go to the king because he's got princely powers, right? So he is the king. Um, so he does what the kings of England did with their parliament. He says, you know, let's make a deal here. And every time he made a deal, the House of Delegates got a little, he had to give up a little power to this House of Delegates. By the time the Catholics are thrown out in 1688, the military governors come in. They are military governors, but they're running the state with a House of Delegates and the governor's great council of Maryland, the two houses. Every time they want to do anything, the colonists say, oh, the Catholics are coming, the Catholics are coming, we need to buy weapons. And the governor says, fine, we're going to buy weapons. And they said, but we're not going to pay for them. <laughs> so the governor couldn't get, these military governors couldn't get anything done. So they, they came up with a new idea. Um, they, they tried to force the issue. They tried to box the House of Delegates in because the delegates had to approve a budget. So they tried sort of earmarking, they tried, you know, amending. That wasn't working. It was just sort of out of hand. So by the time the Calverts switched gears and became Protestants, and a German-speaking king comes to the throne, the, the parliament said, ha, huh, those Marylanders, heck, you can have them back. So Lord Baltimore comes back, but his house of delegates now, when they don't get their way, what do they do? It's the same thing our Congress does. It shut government down. It didn't approve the budget. This is nothing new, folks. Shutting the government down because you're having a political temper tantrum is, is older than the United States. And we've been doing it in Maryland since so, uh, 1720, 1721. Every time we get mad, we're going to shut the government down because we're not getting our way because we're always right. Um, now, we don't do that in Maryland anymore. We've just hiked it up to the national level. But Maryland in the colonial days was the national level. Uh, where are we? We're out of time? Uh, almost. OK. Clerk of the court. Yes, I, I just brought these up. This is the second oldest office in Prince George's County. Next. Sheriff. The oldest office in Prince George's County is the sheriff. What is a sheriff? I don't know if I put that up there or not. What is a Shire Reeve? What is a shire? It's a county. A shire. It's an area. Too. In England, a county and shire are synonymous. And what's a reeve? It's a, somebody who collects stuff. The shire reeve collected the taxes for the king's court. And when you say shire reeve for several centuries, you get sheriff. The ship. Right? Everybody happy? Mm -hmm. Shire Reeves. You can look this stuff up, by the way. You know, you're, you're welcome to challenge me, Shire Reeves. The sheriff, the government of Prince George's County in 1696 was the court. There were no commissioners. There was no legislature. Well, the judges couldn't go out and apprehend a deadbeat. So they brought with them the office of high sheriff, the sheriff. His job, he was not the policeman. He was the officer of the court, mostly to go get people who didn't pay their credit cards. I didn't tell you about that, did I? No. You should hold another session. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think everybody here is enjoying this very much. I, I, <laughs> Debt and credit is another problem that hasn't gone away. Maryland was a very rich colony and a credit colony, um, not a debtor colony. And when I say debtor, I don't mean deadbeat. I mean somebody who borrowed money for a crop and then weather or something came and he couldn't pay it back. There, was no, there were no bankruptcy laws. So what would happen is you couldn't pay it back if your mortgage, if your, your note was called. And there was no currency, so your mortgage and notes were currencies. It's kind of how we got into the bubble in 2008. Same kind of deal. Uh, 
you went to court, the courts issued a writ, and the sheriff went and seized you and your property. And you went to jail. Now, the sheriff didn't get a salary. He charged you a per diem to sit in his jail. <laughs> hey, that way the taxpayers didn't have to pay for the sheriff. It was, you know, it's America. Why well, pay for what you need when somebody else can do? So most, <laughs> most of what the sheriff did was um, probate uh, whatever the courts needed. There was no police force. If there was a murder, <coughs> how was that investigated? Well, there was a state's attorney who comes later. That's the third oldest office. The, the state's attorney, <coughs> or um, we had something called justices of the peace. And we don't have time to go into that. Um, the justice of the peace could ask for a coroner's um, jury. And so they get six men, yeah, it was men, and they go meet in somebody, wherever the body was found, they find the, the nearest parlor or barn, they meet in there, and the state's attorney or the local justice of the peace would lay out the case, and an indictment for murder had to come from, not a grand jury, but a coroner's jury. The coroner's jury said it was accidental, that was the end. The coroner's jury had the power to investigate. Um, it's much more complicated than that, and I think we're running out of time. What's the next? 1696, Prince George's created out of Calvert and Charles. Yes, so here we are, founding on St. George's Day, remember the flags? 1696. Uh, I think I had another. Two sides of Prince George's uh, Yeah, so politically, the county has always been in two parts. There were two kinds of tobacco. Um, one grew well here in Marlboro Clay, some of the planters. You, I guess you love Marlboro Clay. Marlboro Clay produced the lowest nicotine concentrated tobacco in the world. You didn't have to add carcinogens and chemicals to lower the nicotine. So what did we do? We banned oh, yeah. growing the tobacco oh, yeah. so that we could add carcinogens to it from other places where it wasn't naturally low in tar nicotine. Uh, but that's a different story. The Potomac grew a, oh, so the tobacco grown here in the Patuxent, the continent, the Dutch and the French and the Germans liked our tobacco here in the Patuxent. The Potomac Valley grew a different tobacco, and the English liked that tobacco. Later on, that splits the county into, this is Jeffersonian, anti-federalists, don't want any part of the Constitution, and um, certainly not happy with some of the wars. And the Potomac side of the county tended to side with Virginia on matters of things. This side looked to Baltimore and Annapolis, the Patuxent. Potomac looked to the big town of Alexandria, uh, and Georgetown, I guess, a little bit. But the only big town was Alexandria uh, that mattered. Today, you can see vestiges of you know, the, the Potomac side interest and the Patuxent side interest in the county. I think that probably. 1634 to Yeah, we've covered most of the Maryland history that I have time for. I suppose I've used up all the oxygens for questions, or do we have time for questions? Yes, sure. Right, Howard's supposed to be pulling me off the stage whenever. John Peter, I took a class uh, at the Senior Center in Odenton, and uh, there is a successor to Lord Calvert still in England. Yes. I just wanted you to know that. I have his name on my paperwork at, at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so. We saw a picture of him. The Lord's a Calvert um, family. What happens is there's an Ill the sixth Lord Baltimore has an illegitimate son. So uh, there's a big flummox on titles in the 18th century as to what happens. Um, technically, the barony of Baltimore reverts to the crown of England. But there is a direct descendant. Um, but of course, there are buoys. Uh, there, uh, there are culverts here in the county who are direct descendants from the fifth Lord Baltimore. So then you get into the fun and games of which, whose claim is um, legitimate. Legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question, John. Peter Royal here. Um, I think we were talking about, was it John Bain who you kind of said one of his things was going around and enforcing that localities or that the, that folks pay for the schools, right? That they yes. were providing funding to the schools. Do you have any, and so there's a case right now making its way through the courts out of uh, Detroit and that, that public school system where they're going to sue. 
and they're suing because they said you kept me in school for four years and I came out with a worse education than I would have gotten if I had stayed at home. So they take this way all the way through the, the courts and they're going to decide at some point, maybe the Supreme Court will say, well, you don't have a constitutional right to an education anyway. So you should be you know, either happy with what you got or whatever. There's a couple of different arguments to support the, the, the plaintiffs on this, but I'm wondering if you have any insight into what they thought at that time was their charge giving them the authority to enforce the idea that someone should be um, paying for those people's education or so the issue for Bain was th the new state constitution clearly said that each county will set up and be responsible for providing a building and teachers for white students and, and black students um, the Prince George's County, and I'm not sure we were the only county, it's just the only one I know about, the commissioners um, weren't interested in raising taxes and didn't have enough <coughs> cash flow from other sources and so were delinquent on window repair, uh, door installation if I remember, and teacher pay was their big one that they were delinquent in. This didn't really uh, go to, this was more an infrastructure and um, staffing funding question rather than the right to education because the Maryland Constitution basically said there will be public education. So there was no argument on that point, they just weren't doing a very good job of living up to it. No, they were <laughs> promising a lot and paying for little. Um, defer, mostly, um, my guess is they were trying to defer. They didn't want to raise taxes. And they didn't have a lot of taxes they could raise. I mean, where, where are they going to get the money from? It's not like the cornucopia of money that we have. But, and they weren't just, okay, we're not going to support the black schools, we'll only do the white schools from the notes of the minutes of the school board, 1866 to when John Bain dies in 1870. Um, it's pretty much across the board. They didn't want to uh, be creative in financing the public education. But I don't think they were, they weren't against public education, they were just against public financing of education. Right. <laughs> By the way, the first public school was uh, a governor culvert, who some claim was a cousin of Lord Baltimore, and others say was an illegitimate son. This is Charles Culvert, the governor of Maryland, 1721 to 1724. He, his wife inherited land that is now Bladensburg and right up here outside of Upper Marlboro. And together they set up the first public school. Um, it was a, think of it as a charter school. It wasn't really private. It was open to anybody that could afford it. But for reasons that Susan Pearl and I haven't, it, it never took off. It only lasts a few years in the 1720s. So there were attempts at semi-public education in the county uh, that never went anywhere, and it's always for the same reason. Everybody's excited, nobody wants to pay for it. Um, uh, no, th this wasn't in your presentation, but uh, who were the Crosslands? Yes, that's, uh, Calvert married, the original George Calvert marries into the Crossland family. It's another English landed family. So, so you get the coat of arms of the Calverts is the, the, the black and gold of the Calverts and the red and white cross of the Crosslands. That's his wife. I see. Okay, I should probably not tell you this, but what did the Union flag of Maryland look like? Well, first of all, I'll tell you, most of Maryland regiments simply flew the national flag. They didn't have a lot of backing and money, and, and many regiments just flew the flag with a circle of stars and maybe the regiment number in it. But a couple times for parades and things, Maryland had an unofficial flag. What was it? See, flags tell a story. It was the black and gold flag of Bal the city of Baltimore. What was the Confederate flag? The same thing. <laughs> nope. It was the it was the white and red Crossland part. Oh. Yep. What happens in seven in nineteen oh four in the General Assembly? Put them together. Well, they were always together in the coat of arms. The Maryland General Assembly uh, states didn't have official flags until after the Civil War. 
it's a kind of a new thing. Mm -hmm. Maryland adopts the Culvert Code of Arms in 1904. Mm -hmm. But if you read the wording, it's to recognize the contributions of both sides. John Peter, you mentioned that um, uh, the Presbyterians and, um, and whatnot drove the Catholics out. It was the, the Anglicans that drove them out. Drove them yep. out. Okay, so um, this area in, it's no, in northern um, Prince George's County, um, right off of like what Annapolis Road or 450 right now, where you have, there was this huge, um, you know, parcel uh, with I think the Jesuits right. established themselves. So what, what was that about? Yeah, so the, the Jesuits were were here a long time. In fact, uh, Compton Bassett has the Jesuit chapel. You could have a chapel or you could be Catholic on your own property. What you couldn't have was a public building and display. So they drove the Catholics out of political power. Catholics couldn't vote. They couldn't hold office. And they couldn't have a public display. But Jesuits, uh, Catholic orders, the Jesuits had come with Lord Baltimore. Uh, that's also a famous story. Uh, the Catholics were the first ones to try to test Lord Baltimore's separation of church and state. You know, the intolerance acts of um, um, religious freedoms that were granted under Lord Baltimore. The Jesuits claimed that they, did, they could ignore the Maryland Charter because they were religious and therefore they could do whatever they wanted with the Native Americans. The, so there's a lot of Catholics in the state. They just lose all of their rights. It's, um, Catholics were reduced halfway to being enslaved. An enslaved person couldn't vote and couldn't do anything. Catholics couldn't vote and couldn't hold office. It's a little bit, I guess, today like illegal immigrants or aliens or whatever we want to call them. They're kind of in limbo can't vote, they can't hold office for sure, and they're never quite sure what the people in power are going to do to them. So the Jesuits had large landownings here, and there were large Catholic families. They just had no rights, and they had to pay a double tax. Does that have anything to do with the separation of church and state? Well, ultimately it will. Um, the established church which came with the crown governor. So 1688 is a seminal year. And this is when I actually teach the class, we spend a little bit of time on the English Civil War. The English Civil War goes badly for Catholics. <laughs> and it goes wonderfully for Parliament taking over, that the crown, the executive, is no longer really in charge. Um, the English Institute once and for all that the Protestant Church of England is the Church of England. It's the official government church. And when the uh, IPOs, when these businessmen up and down the Atlantic coast were kind of relieved of their charter authority because there were a lot of newcomers who didn't like the idea of one CEO telling them what to do, uh, they invited the Church of England's head, that is, the King of England, or in this case he was a Dutchman, the Dutch King of England. You know who I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. William and Mary, blah, blah, blah. Um, he was a Dutchman, not an Englishman. They brought and passed laws in the 1690s establishing a government church. Now that didn't mean you couldn't be a Baptist or well, you couldn't be a Methodist because they hadn't kind of come around yet. <laughs> you could be a Presbyterian. You could be a Quaker. And if you wanted to support your church and it wasn't outlawed as, as Catholics were in Maryland and Rhode Island, uh, you could do so. But you had to pay in your diocese or parish the parish head tax to the established government church. So if you were a Presbyterian, you wanted to support your church, you would take some money, you know, some tobacco. There was no money, by the way, so you took 
some of your tobacco and you gave it to your church because that made sense. You'd never have a problem doing that. But you had to give a fixed amount to the Church of England down the street. So effectively, you either paid nothing to your church, which meant it couldn't survive, or you were paying twice. And you had no choice. Now, Presbyterians, Protestants, and Quakers could practice openly. They could buy a piece of land, declare it church land, and they could <coughs> come from their surrounding farms, and the, you know their church was a community building. Catholics couldn't do that. They could build it. If they had enough land, such as Compton Bassett, they could take and build a chapel. In this case, I, maybe they've restored a building and turned it into a chapel. We're not quite sure what was going on there. Um, and then they had Jesuit and later Dominican traveling preachers who would come to give Catholic mass. This was all illegal, unless you did it privately in your home. And that comes out of the English Civil War in the 1640s. Anybody else? John Peter, I have a quick question. You keep referring to what I'm from Montgomery County originally, but I always refer to it as Calvert County, and you say it with a shibboleth, Calvert County. Can you yeah, explain I that? make phone calls, not phone cows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up hearing it as Calvert County, okay. not culvert. It's not a culvert, right. a farm culvert. Right. It's like a phone call, right. a culvert county. Gotcha. Um, I have a hard enough telling people that if you say PG, I'm going to fine you a dollar. <laughs> Wayne Curry used to give me a dollar every time his, he knew I'd come after him. He said PG because I find it to be a pejorative. It's Prince too. George's County or it's a dollar. <laughs> so he, at one chamber meeting, he walked in, saw me, headed over, and he says, I'm giving John Peter $10. He waves it just in case. <laughs> Um, so it's the same thing. I mean, today English changes, pronunciation changes. I just grew up with Culvert. Right. Not Cal Ripken. Yeah, Cal not Calvert. Cal Ripken. Yeah, I, I don't make phone <laughs> cows. Yeah. That makes well, sense. Thank you. Aren't any more questions? I just want to, on all of our behalfs, thank you very much for your stimulating nearly two hour treatise on the <laughs> <laughs>